my mind is racing with the question, are you still good? Can you make something from the wreckage? Would you take this heart and make it whole again? Mountains may be moved into the sea, though the ground beneath might crumble and give way. I can hear my father singing over me. It's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. I blame myself, and if I'm on Maybe I blamed you too But you would not forsake me Cause only good things come from you Though the mountains may be moved into the sea Though the ground beneath might crumble and give way I can hear my father singing over me it's gonna be okay it's gonna be okay from beginning to the end you're so close you have never let me down and you won't in the valleys and the shadows I know you're so close we're so close. Though the mountains may be moved into the sea, though the ground beneath may crumble and give way, I can hear my father singing over me. It's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. Definitely not Mother's Day. <laughs> testing, testing, testing. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church on this uh, Father's Day. And it was kind of cool as we were praying this morning. Uh, our prayers focused around Father's Day actually could be, it's obviously celebratory, but Father's Mother's Day could also be a difficult time as well for a number of reasons. Uh, one reason could be that maybe you had a lousy father. <laughs> Secondly, maybe you've lost your father. And so this day can kind of bring up some kick up some dust a little bit. And the important thing to remember is that what Jesus, what Jesus has done on the cross for us, when Jesus died and rose again, that the Apostle Paul tells us that God brought us in through Jesus into, into his family, that we were adopted, we were grafted into the family as sons and daughters. And so not, not just as servants, which we are, but as sons and daughters. And so there's there's never a day or a time where you don't have a father. You always have a father. And because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross and because he lost, he lost his father on the cross, we will never be without a father. 
And so if you've lost your father, if you've lost your earthly dad or you had a lousy dad, it's okay. You have a wonderful, gracious, loving, heavenly dad. And the word that Jesus taught his disciples to use for God, very interesting, because in that time in the people of Israel and in the ancient uh, ancient Near East, you didn't you never you didn't call God Father. It was something that was uh, that would be. They had more of a reverence and a fear for spiritual majesty than we do now. And God was to be revered and feared. And Jesus taught his disciples. He says, uh, when you pray. He says, pray like this, our Father, our Abba. And so you hear this Aramaic word come out. Not, It's not Greek, it's Aramaic, which is what they spoke, and it's Abba. And I did a study on that a couple years ago, very interesting in, in the New Testament. And one commentator, Frederick Dale Bruner, said that uh, when, what, what's the first words you learn as a, as a child? It's typically like a mama, or papa, or dada. Those are typically, they're the most primitive first feelings of connection that you have as a child, as a baby. And what is Jesus teaching us? That that, that early, early primitive, like spiritual child hanging on to Abba. It's like Papa, Dada, Mama, it's Abba. And that's as about as intimate and it's about as close as you could get. And we have that because of what Jesus did on the cross and his glorious resurrection. You have a wonderful, caring, loving Abba. And here's something else. He loves you enough. Uh, I know we hear, my teacher at seminary, Gerhard Ferdi, used to say, all you hear these days is God is love, 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 love. And he goes, and it's turned into a meaningless cipher. But he says, you got to remember that love sometimes requires God to dislike a lot of the things that you are in and what you're doing. Love requires that. Real love lets you go your own way. It doesn't let you go your own way. Real, that, that's, that's apathy. Real love. See, Lewis, C.S. Lewis says, the, op, the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is apathy. I don't care. And God loves us enough to see us where we are and to see us going astray. And he says, I'm not going to let them go. I'm not going to let them run off. I'm not going to let them turn to our own ways. And so we say God is love. That doesn't mean he blesses every little thing that pops into your sinful mind or little, every inclination that we have. The whole point of the cross is that he loves us to free us from our self-enslavement, not to bless our self-enslavement. And so that's the whole point. When you look at a cross and you see Jesus Christ on us, on it, that means that it's sort of, that means, that means if you want a relationship with God, that's the only way. It kind of means game over for your efforts when you see Jesus on the cross. And now because of what he has done, we could repent, we could come before him, and as we used to confess in the, the old liturgy, we confess to God that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves, and that we have sinned against our God in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. But by his great love for us, Jesus Christ came to save us and to liberate us. And so he calls us to repent before him and to enter into his loving arms as a child of God defined by what he says, not what your culture says about you or what you say about you. It's critically, critically, critically important because we live in a time now where all that matters is what you think about yourself. Whatever you think about yourself, that's just great. We'll honor that. And that's not the gospel. The gospel is the exact opposite. The, The gospel is you need to repent of what you think about yourself and listen to what God says about you despite what you feel. Critically important. Marva Dawn, uh, Marva Dawn was a theologian. She had a wonderful uh, saying. She says, you know, we live in the age of the golden opinion. <laughs> you know, all that matters is my opinion, my opinion. You know, in front of God, we're called to lay all that stuff down and listen, listen to your shepherd's voice over every other voice. Jesus said in John chapter 10, what did he say? I'm the good shepherd. And he says, my sheep know my voice and I call them by name, and they listen to me. And so today, my prayer is uh, for dads, moms, sons, daughters, nieces, nephews, aunts, uncles, that you would hear the voice of your shepherd today. And, and, as, and as the Bible says, and, and don't, hard, don't harden your heart. I mean, some of us come maybe with hearts that have been calloused and, and hardened today. You know, and that's the one condition that 
drives you away from God is that cold, brittle, hardened heart. And sometimes it's really scary to open up your heart, especially to a loved one, especially to a friend. And it's even scarier to open up your heart to one who knows you better than you know yourself. And because when Jesus Christ gets a hold of your heart, who knows what, what he's going to do with it, right? And it's always for his glory and for his goodness. And so my prayer is that you'd open your heart to him. And as we worship and sing, listen to what we're praising, what we're saying, and when we praise him, it's praising him for his grace. We praise him. Our second song today is called One of My Favorites. And I love it because it's called When Your Kingdom Comes. And it's an image of what your father ultimately is going to do for you. We'll close with this. What ultimately, and then we're just going to go home. I'm kidding. Uh, the second song tells us about ultimately what God did for us on the cross through Jesus. And it's a, it, it, the, the whole song is lifted basically from the book of Revelation. And I love to say this at, at funerals when people are mourning the death of a loved one. And maybe for some of you today, I want you to listen to the words of this song and I want you to think of your dad that maybe is in the arms of Jesus now. And I know there's probably a lot of you here today like that. And I'll just share this because I love to say this at, at memorial services. In, in Revelation 21, it's the second to last chapter of the Bible. <laughs> and Jesus gives the author of Revelation, this guy named John, he gives him a glimpse you know, just a boom, boom. He gives him a glimpse of heaven. It's really cool. I mean, we don't get these glimpses. But we do because John gave, Jesus gave it to John, and then John gives it to us. And John says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Everything was different, for the old things have passed away. And he says, And then I, heard, I, I saw heaven coming down as a bride prepared for her husband right? That's an image for the church. It's an image for us. And how have we been prepared? We're a people prepared because of what Jesus has done. And, and then he said, and I heard a loud voice saying, and this, behold, look, I love that. Look, God's home is now with his people. You don't need to live by faith anymore. You don't need hope anymore. Faith has been realized. Hope has been realized. You're now, 1 Corinthians 13 says at that time, we, now we see through a mirror dimly. But what does he say? What does Paul say? Then, prosopon to prosopro. Uh, it literally means nose to nose in the original language, face to face. And John describes more of what he doesn't see than what he does see in Revelation 21. He says, and there will be no more mourning or crying or pain. And he says, or death. Isn't that interesting? If I got a glimpse of heaven, I wouldn't describe what I didn't see. I would describe what I saw. And he describes more of what's not there. And there's no more mourning or crying or death or pain. For the old order of things have, has passed away. And he says, then I heard the voice of Jesus saying, see, I am the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. And then he tells John, now, John, write this stuff down. Huh? Write my words down, for you can trust them. I love that. And then the vision closes. And so I wonder, you guys, you remember John Newton's famous hymn, When We've Been There 10,000 Years, Amazing Grace? What's he saying? Gosh, when we've been there millennium after millennium after millennium in heaven, he says, you barely just started. And I wonder if when we've been there 10,000 years, all of us, if we look at one another and, and death has been swallowed up so much by Jesus Christ, because it's gone, right? John tells us that in the Revelation 21, it's gone. I wonder if we're gonna look at each other and someone mentions death and we say, what's that? Huh, I wonder what that is. How cool is that? With It's been so swallowed up in the victory of Jesus that it's ultimately, it's power and it's sting, as 1 Corinthians 15 tells us, is just erased. It's just gone, and it's swallowed up by the victory of Jesus Christ. Hmm. That's who your father is. That's as good as good gets. So, Lord, we thank you, and we pray that you, Lord, are heavenly father. For we know every other, every other father is just a weak approximation to you. 
Thank you that you are with us today, that you don't leave your children, that we try and leave you over and over again, Lord. But thank you, Father, that in Jesus Christ, you're way faster than us and you're way stronger than us. And so, Father, today we pray for all those prodigals that maybe have turned from you, that are in the far country and have turned their back on you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that in Jesus Christ, when we turned our back on you, you didn't, you didn't do that to us. As a matter of fact, it catalyzed your action. You came, you called, you searched, and ultimately you found. So, Father, I pray that you would uh, open up hearts today. Open up hearts as we praise you, as we hear your holy word, the proclamation of the gospel, and that we are just filled with the power of your Holy Spirit and filled with the joy of being a son and a daughter today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's stand and praise our Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Dan brought up Revelation, and it's on my heart, too. Um, so, yeah, this song is amazing. That song is amazing. 
We're singing holy, holy, holy later in all of this. Thank you, Annie, is reminding us all of, of Revelation and what John saw, what God showed him. And so I'm going to read this from Revelation 7. And this is our future as brothers and sisters together forever. Um, then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him, serve him every day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Please be seated. We're going to go into a time of communion now. And it's, uh, I wanted to share with you in the Old Testament, five, six hundred years before Jesus, there was a really dark time, and it's called the Babylonian exile, where the, where the Babylonian Empire came and, and sacked Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. And it was a super, obviously, nationally traumatic time for them. 
and many of the people of Israel were exiled off into Babylon. And so it was a really dark time, and there was a prophet. There were a couple prophets during that period. One of them is my personal favorite because he was a really young guy when God called him, and he thought he was unworthy to speak God's word because he was so young, and that was Jeremiah. And Jeremiah, when he was called by God, spoke to God and said, I can't do this. I'm just a boy. And God said to him, don't you dare say that you're just a boy. He says, because when I put my words in your mouth, it's not about you, Jeremiah, and your age and your intelligence and your looks. It's about my words that go forward. So you're not just a boy. You're my messenger. And it stunk because Jeremiah's message was doom and gloom. That's what God called him to preach, that it's bad and you guys are unfaithful and there's going to be a big exile. And so it was a real dark, depressing time. As a matter of fact, people hated Jeremiah. The people of Israel hated him because he was, they called him doom and gloom. And they liked these fake prophets that would tell them, no, 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 it's okay. God loves you. Everything's fine. And Jeremiah was like, he does love you, but everything's not fine. And the fake prophets would persecute Jeremiah. The, the, the religious leaders persecuted Jeremiah. And you know, many times, don't miss this, as I alluded to earlier, sometimes God has to speak a harsh word. And so that was, it was a really, really, really deep, sorrowful, maudlin time for the people of Israel. And there's a gem in that long book, 50 plus chapters of Jeremiah, where God gives a word to Jeremiah. And he said, I got something for you though. It's dark now. He says, but the days are surely coming, says the Lord when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. He says, it won't be like the old one I made with them. Though they broke it, he says, God says, though I was a husband to them and they cheated on me. It won't be like that one. He says, here's what I'm gonna do with the new covenant. He says, I'm gonna write my words on their heart. And he says, so all will know me from the least to the greatest. They will all know me. And he says, and I will remove their guilt from them. I will remove their sin from them. And I will remember it no more. Huh? There's a new covenant, God says, a new promise, a new testament that's coming in the midst of the darkness. And it's crazy. 600 years later, here comes a peasant Jewish carpenter's son man who on one Passover Eve gathers his friends together and he says, This is my body, which will be given up for you. Huh? Do this in memory of me. Take it and eat it. And then Jesus did this. He took the cup and hearkening back 600 years earlier, and he says, this cup is the new covenant. Huh? This cup is the new covenant, the new promise that Jeremiah talked about. It's here. It looks dark now. I'm going to the cross. The new covenant has started. And it will be shed, the covenant is in my blood, which will be shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. So take this and drink of it in memory of me. And before we pray the Lord's Prayer, my teacher, uh, Dr. Nestigan, always used to tell us in the old Lutheran liturgy, they used to say that Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper here, was a foretaste. You, any of you remember that term? Let this be a foretaste of the feast to come. And scripturally, we know that when we come and take communion, it's, you guys, it's a, you get to taste heaven a little bit. Because Jesus says, I'm there. I'm in the bread and the wine. I'm there. And it's a foretaste of the feast to come. It's a little foretaste. And so as we sung about heaven, come, come on your knees. That's the only way to approach a king as you are able. Come on your knees, put your hand out, and receive the gift that God gives to you. And it's a take, have a taste of heaven today. And so we pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
please come forward to receive these gifts of God. And then please return to your seat for prayer. extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to blot out their name from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned.
starting this song now, and we're going to sing it for eternity. Thank you, Lord, for my brothers and sisters here that are part of this big family. Thank you for your word that's coming to us now. Prepare our hearts. Holy are you, Lord. Amen. Church said amen. amen. 
like that. All right. Everybody's awake. I love that. Uh, of course, it's such a special day. Of course, we're saying amen to that beautiful worship that we're just participating in. We're always excited about that. We say we agree. Amen. We agree. Well, loved ones, let me begin by saying happy Father's Day. Uh, any fathers, raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand. We're still, yes, we're still proud to be fathers. That's true, we are. It is amazing. Out of 20, 20 holidays, 10 federal and 20 general holidays in the United States, Father's Day ranks 18 out of 20. We're just a notch below Arbor Day, but we're trying. We're <laughs> trying. We're trying to bring it back, all right? We're trying our best. Well, anyway, Pastor Dan has asked me to speak today as he gets prepped mentally for his award at the end of our service. It's coming up, folks, okay? He's going to be out of town during our annual commencement on July 9th, and uh, so we're going to honor him today right at the end of this service, so don't leave. We'll only take five minutes or so. It's going to be a wonderful event. As a matter of fact, it's so wonderful, the pastor's in a coat and tie. Come on. Wow. Wasn't sure I'd ever see that. I wasn't sure. So listen, listen, I'm up. I'm going to continue in the Gospel of Luke. The good news, of course, if you know me, you've heard me before, I am not a long-winded preacher. Just like, Zsa, just like Zsa Zsa Gabor told her fifth husband, I won't keep you long. So here we go. <clears throat> Over the past number of weeks, of course, we've been in the Gospel of Luke discussing certainly the early years, the mid-years of the ministry of Jesus. We remember his baptism in uh, Luke chapter 3 where, where his Father in heaven says, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. His identity was audibly and firmly established and then quickly challenged, of course, by the devil in Luke 4 after Jesus is shoved into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. You've got to read the Greek. He wasn't led into the Spirit. He was pushed into the, in, into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will give you a little push. Okay, just remember that. And basically the devil challenges his baptismal identity. And if the devil will challenge the baptismal identity of Jesus. He will challenge yours. Please. He will challenge. If you are who God says you are, then why are you acting like that? Why are you doing this? If you are who you say you are. Then uh, in Luke chapter 5, we see that uh, Jesus heals a, a, a paralytic. A fish, fish nets are, are breaking all over the place. A leper is being cleansed. In chapter 6, Jesus uh, delivers some beatitudes. He gathers a great crowd to listen to his teaching. He, he heals a man with a withered hand. In chapter 7, he heals a centurion servant. He's sick and, and dying. And then he raises a widow's son who's dead. Word is getting out. In chapter 8, Jesus demonstrates complete power over nature by calming a violent storm with little more than a sit down and shut up. And, and also in, in chapter 8, he delivers the, uh, this demon possessed in Gadara, one called Legion due to the vast number of demons. But for Jesus, it's no problem since he knows who he is. He knows his baptismal identity and he has all authority. And the entire town, remembers is in an uproar after he casts the demons into pigs. The first recorded instance of deviled ham. Word. <laughs> you know, I thought that was pretty good last night. I didn't know it'd go that well. <laughs> but word is getting out. He heals a woman with an issue of blood for 12 years. Her blood won't stop flowing. And on the same day, he raises a 12-year-old girl whose blood has stopped flowing. She's dead. Jesus stops the blood flow for one and restarts it for another. Jesus doesn't just cure sickness, he cures death. Word is getting out. Then he feeds 5,000, if not 15,000, with five loaves, two fish. And hear me, no matter what you have in your checkbook, it's that's all you got in your checkbook, five loaves and two fish. And some of you, that's all you got. It's more than enough. You just look to heaven and you thank God. Amen? But word is getting out. And last week we witnessed a rather private affair, his glory being revealed, but, but much of what he's doing in his ministry is very, very public. See, loved ones, Luke 8 and 9 is like a highlight reel for Jesus. If you were an athlete, this is your highlight reel. 
And the crowds are following everywhere uh, in, in Luke 8, 40. Now when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. When the crowds learned it, they followed him, Luke 9, 11. The next day, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him, Luke 9, 37. So over a dozen times in, in Luke's gospel, it stated that great crowds were following him. No doubt about it, loved ones, to use the vernacular of the day, Jesus is trending. Jesus is trending. His popularity is off the charts. He's trending. He's getting a lot of likes. But not all, certainly not in Gadara, where he ruined their bacon industry. That didn't help. And he's not getting a lot of uh, help out of Nazareth either. But for the most part, he's trending. Thumbs up. Now, with less than a year left in his ministry, a very popular Jesus knows that he needs to come down from the top of the Mount of Transfiguration go down into the valley of the shadow of death and set his face like a flint to Jerusalem and the cross on, as Pastor Dan said, our behalf. And on his way to Jerusalem, the great physician sends out 70 or 72 interns. So he's picking up followers, teaching them, sending them out. You see, loved ones, this was never intended to be a one-man show. Never was it going to be a one-man show. And for those whose emotions are high and they're excited about following Jesus, we suddenly learn, uh-oh, here we come, there's a cost. Oh, whoop, whoop, he talks about the cost of discipleship. And this morning, Jesus encounters three promising disciples who want to follow him. At least they indicate they want to follow him on their own terms. But Jesus always speaks to the person's true needs and especially the idol that might have control over the person. And remember, when Jesus invited someone to come into his kingdom and follow, he asked that person for the rest of their life. The rest of their life. He didn't want the emotion of a moment. He wanted the carefully thought out, understood commitment of a lifetime. He's asking for the rest of their life in the present imperative. That is for permanent following. It's not an event. It's the rest of your life. And life by God's power is available now. If you want the life, the logical step is to become a disciple, an apprentice, a follower of Jesus, a disciple in the Greek, a mathetes, a student, a learner. Christianity was never intended to produce Christians, only disciples. And the commission was not go into all the world and make Christians. No, make disciples. In fact, the Bible used the word disciple about 270 times. As Dallas Willard writes, the New Testament is a book about disciples, by disciples, for disciples. Amen? Amen. Someone once asked me years ago, asked me, Dr. Adams, do you, uh, do you believe in eternal security? I thought, I'm going to answer it this way. I said, let me answer it this way. Let's say I don't believe in eternal insecurity. Oh, so you... I believe that if you're saved, you're saved. But how about this? Once a disciple, always a disciple? Not a fat chance. No way. Disciples left Jesus just like students leave schools all the time, especially when the going gets tough. They left him. Read John 6, 6, 6. That's chapter 6, verse 66. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. No longer. They're done. They're not coming back. So like Jesus, I'm not interested in the good feelings and excitement of the moment or baptism or confirmation. I'm only interested in true lifelong commitment. So we have before us this morning three illustrations. And the word follow appears in each one from the Greek word... Uh, uh, aklathiste, from which we get our word acolyte, of course. And now two times, would-be disciples come up and declare that they'll follow. And the middle one, Jesus commands to follow. So here's the text, Luke 9, 57 through 62, if you want to open your Bible or turn it on. <laughs> we have those options, unfortunately. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. 
Still another said, I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Wow. Candidate numero uno, number one, volunteers brightly. I'll follow you wherever you go. Now that's just what any pastor or Christian leader wants to hear. And Matthew 8 tells us that it's not just any guy, this is a scribe that makes the announcements. Now that's even more fascinating. A scribe is attracted to Jesus and says, I'll follow you wherever you go. I'm done with my past, whatever it's been. I'm going to leave my career as a scribe. Wow. Because scribes were very esteemed people in in Jewish life. I mean, scribes were the experts of the law. They were the lawyers, the religious lawyers who interpreted the law and the way lawyers interpret the law of the land today. And let it be known that I do love lawyers, especially if they're in the audience. Okay. A, A scribe had a bit of a pampered life, though. Plenty of food, plenty of clothing, shelter, and money. So how does Jesus respond to the statement, I will follow you wherever you go. He says, oh, super duper. Great, welcome to the church. Great to have you on board. I'm sure you fit in. Let me give you something to do. Tithing cards are in the back. No. Matter of fact, after the amazing declaration, Jesus comes back with a bucket of cold water. It's just a bucket of cold water, folks. That's all it is. It's a bit of a beat now. And he uses very two uh, uh, very common examples of animals to make a point, foxes and birds. Foxes, of course, were everywhere in, in Israel. You remember Samson when he tied 300 foxes by their tails in the book of Judges. He lit a torch between their tails and sent them through the Philistine uh, grain fields, olive groves, and the vineyards, burning their crops. And kids, don't try that at home. This was a time of the judges, and there was little care for people or animals, unfortunately. Foxes have holes. That is, they have a place to get out of the weather, a place to hide from predators, or even Samson, a place to eat, a place to sleep, a a place to store food. Foxes are good at killing and then storing. That's why when they get in a hen house, they kill everything in the hen house. They don't kill one at a time. They take them all out till they're all dead because they're going to come back, pick each one at a time, take it back to store it. That's a fox. They're deceptive. They're sneaky. And they do more killing than needed. That's why Jesus referred to Herod Antipas as that fox. He wasn't talking about his looks. That fox in Luke 13, 31. Foxes are unclean, unsavory animals. But foxes have food, shelter, and protection, as do birds. Birds were certainly everywhere. At some seasons, there are more birds in the land of Israel than in any other place on this planet. More birds. At migrating season, 500 million birds migrate down through Europe to Africa through Israel. Amazing. And a better translation than they have nests is that they have roosts. There's always a place for a bird to rest. So, Mr. Scribe, I say this to you. During our journey, we will not be staying at the Marriott with a breakfast buffet included. No valet service, no room service. We have no room. You're a scribe, a lawyer. You're used to the finer things in life, the comforts of food, clothing, shelter, and the acclaim of people. You follow me, it's not going to happen. Do you seriously want to identify yourself with someone who is even worse off than animals? Basically, I'm homeless. I can only promise you hardship. I'm not a faith movement or American Christianity with its name it and claim it and Lab it and grab it, voice it and Rolls Royce it, call it and haul it. None of that. No. There's a good chance it's going to be bleak. You cannot glibly follow Jesus without understanding there's a price that has to be paid. So the first guy a volunteer is is challenged. And with the second stranger he meets on the road, Jesus takes the initiative, calling him, you follow me. It's pretty imperative. And the response is, okay, but let me go and bury my father first. Oh, poor chap, look at that. His dad died. Obviously, this is not the best text on on Father's Day, I guess. Uh, But if his dad has just died, uh, of course he needs to go and make necessary arrangements. But Jesus doesn't bite. No, no. He says, let the dead bury their dead. You go and proclaim the kingdom of God. You go. How callous. I mean, how unfeeling our Lord sounds. But once again, we're not familiar with the Middle Eastern jargon. 
because the phrase to bear one's father is a traditional idiom which actually refers to the duty of a son to remain at home and care for his parents until they are laid to rest respectfully. If his father had actually died, he would not have been on the road bumping into Jesus. Come on, sir. He would have been at home keeping vigil over the body. There's no dead body here. Instead, follower number two has what we call a delay tactic. What it really means is let me go and serve my father while he's alive, and after he dies, I'll bury him. Then at last I'll be free to give your call my undivided attention, and if I hang around home, I'll get my inheritance. Then I'll have enough money to follow you. I heard what you said to the last guy. Sounds kind of bleak. I'd rather have my inheritance. Of course, listen, that's not unreasonable by human standards, but if you tell Jesus, if you tell him this, I feel a conflicting pull of family and social obligations, surely you don't expect me to violate these. He will say that is precisely what he does expect. Proclaiming the kingdom of God is the most pressing and important duty in the world, in the pulpit, at work, in both words and deeds. And when you and I are called to that duty, I must make priority over everything, including traditional family conventions. Ooh, let the spiritually dead bury the spiritually dead. The third encounter also has a meaning which isn't immediately obvious. I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Fair enough, dude. Fair. Seems to be common politeness requires, but Jesus will have none of it. No, 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 not going to happen. No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. And using the uh, old light Palestinian plow is very tricky. You had to guide it with your left hand alone, keeping the other hand free to drive the pair of oxen pulling the plow, and all the time you've got to keep your eyes fixed between the hindquarters of the oxen on the furrow. If you look behind, the furrow becomes crooked. Work is actually counterproductive for the farmer. So, what about not even being allowed to say goodbye? Well, that's the point. The word in the text doesn't literally mean say goodbye. It means take one's leave from, and there's a crucial difference. The third recruit is really saying this. I can't come and join you until I've taken my leave from. That is, I've got permission from those at home. That is, my father. Happy Father's Day. According to Kenneth Bailey, who lived in that area for years, a scholar, graduated from uh, Concordia, St. Louis, with a PhD. Um, thank you. Uh, the father is almost certain to refuse to let the boy wander off on some questionable enterprise following some religious nutcase out of Nazareth. Chances are slim. So, in the culture of that place and time, the boy would automatically accept his father's authority was supreme, that he must get permission before venturing out. It's cultural. There is cultural and community peer pressure here. And yet Jesus himself, a young man, barely in his 30s, barely in his 30s, is shockingly claiming an even higher authority, that of a heavenly father. A heavenly father. So if we're serious about being disciples, we may be called to suffer, we may be called to lose friends, husband or wife, even become alienated from family and loved ones. And we're not told by Luke what happened to today's three potential converts on the road, whether in the end, after Jesus had not minced words with any of them. They signed up or not. Because the question really is, will you follow now? Today is the day of salvation. Will you follow now? Now, for those of you who are lifelong disciples, remember that Jesus said this as well. Come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest, for my burden is easy and my yoke is light. Seems like a flat contradiction to what we've just been hearing here, but no, not at all. It's just simply the other side of the coin. Yes, Jesus warns us how much we're, we're going to lose, possibly, but then he tells us of the reward, the great blessing for those who have the courage to take the lifelong plunge. And it's a lifelong plunge. For well, they find to their relief and amazement that because they were prepared to lose their lives, they actually found their lives. They've gained them. And they know for the first time that nothing, no disaster, no misfortune, no pain in the end can destroy them. Because of the rest of their lives and beyond, those individuals are in the arms of a loving God. So the message, as I 
get ready to take my seat. It's trifold. You have to count the cost. It's God's authority, okay? Count the cost one. It's God's authority over any family authority, and you can't follow Jesus looking backwards. You can't have a divided heart. You can't be Mr. Facing both ways, to borrow the words of John Bunyan. I'm thinking now of a young man. He was just 16 years old when he came to Jesus in Chicago and he went to Yale. His parents sent him there. He was a young man with a lot of money. His name was William Borden. He was part of the uh, Borden fortune. Remember Borden and Borden Farms? And anybody remember Elsie the cow? Yeah, that's who I'm talking about. Their son. When he graduated high school, his parents sent him on a trip around the world. And it's that where he had a relationship with Jesus, but he knew, seeing what the world looked like, how bad it looked, that he was going to become a missionary. He was going to decry all the funds, all the money. He added some of his friends going, you idiot. You're a multimillionaire. You're turning it. I'm going to become a missionary. And what he did on campus at Yale and Princeton, he started a Bible study, Bible club, and he had over a thousand young men and women attending that Bible study in Yale and Princeton back in the day and then he knew that God had called him, he felt God had called him to take care of Muslims, Chinese Muslims and so he headed to Egypt to study Arabic and Chinese and in Egypt he gets spinal meningitis and dies at 25. And in his Bible, he found it later, it said this, just three lines, multimillionaire kid decries it all, I don't want any of it, I'm going to be a missionary for Jesus. This is what it said, it said, no reserves, no retreats, no regrets. That's us, folks, no reserves, no retreats, no regrets. The one who's truly being prompted by the Spirit of God and brought into the kingdom is going to say, Jesus Christ is so infinitely valuable to me that I don't care what the price is. The world may be your oyster, but there's a pearl of great price. And I will follow until there's no more road to follow meaning the road stops in heaven, in his presence, in his presence, and that's when you and I are going to get our diploma. Amen? That's my sermon. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to have a word of prayer, and then I'm going to take my lead back there. I'm going to dress up a little bit. I'll look a little more Lutheran to look out now. Um, uh, but, but let me have a word of prayer with you, and then John Wheeler's going to come up and say a few things, and then we'll bring our graduate up. Heavenly Father, thank you for our time today. Lord, make us followers. If there's any part of our heart that resists that, Lord, make us followers. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, make us lifetime, lifetime followers of you. We will be disciples till the end, till we get to heaven. No matter what age, be it 25 or 125, Lord, make us yours. We commit that to you. This day is the day of salvation. We follow now. Help us with that, Lord Jesus. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on up, John. <clears throat> that was an amazing word, Dr. Michael Adams. Thank you so much. Can we get a round of applause? Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Amen, amen. Go ahead, sure, man. So a little bit of a different dress attire oh, for you, uh, for, uh, for us today, I guess, huh? Uh, happy Father's Day. Uh, well, there have a slight accident in the back. This is a, I stand on the shoulder of giants um, at Faith International University, and I've had the privilege of serving there for over a decade as now the executive vice president and 
gone, go with Dr. Adams all over the nation. This will be our 51st uh, commencement ceremony, as Dr. Adams stated. Um, but Dan will be on military orders and uh, orders he follows. Uh, first and foremost, from our Heavenly Father. I've seen uh, Dan, our pastor, I've seen him teach and preach, not just obviously here, but all over the, this nation as he's come with us on what are called faith talks and or other adventure, ministry adventures, we call them missionary adventures, because uh, we'll go to missionary bases where they welcome us with open arms because of how we, what we offer as far as scholarships to missionaries or to kingdom partners and to other um, organizations and denominations and things that we have a relationship and a fellowship with uh, all across the U.S. Well, today we'll be leaving, we, as traditional on Father's Day, everyone knows in, my, in our house, that on Father's Day, we're going to be with the National Baptists. So on to, after this service, we'll be heading to the airport to fly to Nashville to drive to Louisville, Kentucky, because we'll be with 40,000 African-American missionary Baptist pastors and delegates and two white guys. <laughs> they, say, they say we stand out a little. It, I, I'm not sure if it's the hat or the coat or, they say, or the lapel, uh, but just dear brothers, dear brothers and sisters in Christ and it's, it's such an honor and a privilege to be able to do this on behalf of not just Faith International, but be, for the Lord. Amen? The uh, Faith, as, as, you, as you probably know, uh, but I'll, it's, I, I can't not say this, that Faith International University was founded in 1969, so we're not new to education by any means. It was founded on the inerrancy of Scripture, meaning every single word in your Bible is true. And that's how it was founded, because there was, a, a, there was a break in the Lutheran church. Some of you, most of you remember that there was a time when they said, ah, some of this isn't true. And the church said, part of the church, part of the Lutheran church said, no, 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 no. And so the bylaws in the, church, in the, in the denomination at that time, they said, if you're going to disband or make any changes to the doctrinal statement, you have to disband and form your own 501c3 or your own denominational church. And so they did. And Dr. Reuben Radel, the founder of Faith Seminary, Faith Evangelical Lutheran Seminary, at the time, founded Faith. His successor, Dr. Michael Adams, is going to come to the stage in just one second. This man, uh, he's going to be speaking about dance. I'm going to speak about him. He is a father to so many men in ministry. He has so many sons in the ministry. Hundreds, if not thousands, call him dad. He said, I would not be where I'm at if it was not for you, Dr. Adams. <laughs> I wouldn't be where I'm at in life if it wasn't for the Lord and that man. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Michael Adams. Thank you, thank you. No, remain seated, remain seated. That's good. No, I'm teasing. Here we go. Uh, no. Listen, I'm uh, so excited today to be here. Of course, Pastor Dan, we're honoring him today only because he cannot be at our July commencement. Uh, the Navy has called him away, and their prayers were stronger than mine. So uh, we decided to do this uh, on, on this day, and so... What we're going to do, I'm going to read this um, diploma here in just a second. I think it's right under here. And uh, we're going to call him up. And I just want to say, uh, if you get a chance to come to our commencement on July 9th, because that's a Sunday evening at 6 o'clock, uh, it's held at the Church for All Nations, please, you'll be invited. I'll give you more information about that later. But it's a delight. I think we have probably 70, 72 graduates coming out this year. Uh, but this one is coming out a little bit early. Uh, just, it's the Navy's fault. What are we going to do? Just got to blame it on somebody. But no, I thought it would be good for you to see kind of what we do, because we have this great relationship, something that Jesus has, has put together. So at this time, I am going to read this. Faith International University, on recommendation of the faculty, has conferred upon Daniel Shaw, degree of Doctor of Ministry in Christian Apologetics. We call that dead man's curve. Very few people make that degree. In recognition of the satisfactory fulfillment of the requirements pertaining to this degree, 
In testimony whereof, we the undersigned affix our signatures on this 18th day of June in the year of our Lord 2023 with all the honors and privileges pertaining to this degree. Reverend Dr. Daniel Shaw, please come receive your degree. It's a good photo op. Okay. There's Kim. All right. There's Okay. Whoops. Oh. <laughs> now, one thing we do know as well that no nobody ever really gets through a doctoral degree. No man ever gets through a doctoral degree, I tell you this, without help from his wife. We know that behind We know that behind every successful husband is a very surprised wife. <laughs> All right. But nobody gets through this. As a matter of fact, it was to the point that we were thinking about offering the wives of this a PhD, putting hubby through. <laughs> but with that in mind, I'm going to ask Pastor Dan to kneel here, as we do with all of those receiving the doctoral. If you'll kneel, please, Pastor Dan and uh, John Wheeler and your wife will be putting this hood on you. This is another good photo op moment here, folks. So this is your pastor, ladies and gentlemen, the Reverend Dr. Daniel Shaw. Let's all get in here. Okay, what we're going to do is, I think we're going to have a quick uh, a little bit of, after I do the benediction, I think we might hear a little bit of, uh, are we ready with a little song? Have we got a little bit of Mighty Fortress ready to go? Do we? All right, so that's, and we're going to walk out. Please keep your seats till we get out that door and then come greet us with just such joy. I know I'm excited about it, okay? So let us, uh, let's, let's uh, stand in for a benediction. <clears throat> First in Hebrew, then in Greek, Ye vereka kairanai vishmareka, ya er aranai pana veleka vikuneka, ye saa aranai pana veleka viyasam laka shalom. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, God bless you.